Good evening, everyone. Welcome again to the Euro 2020 warm-up. We're warming up to another huge night in the round of 16. We are at the halfway mark. We've got so much on the cards just in the warm-up show alone, let alone the uh, the night that is coming up with uh, two live football matches. We'll go around the grounds as we always do. But, uh, of course, to get you in the mood, we'll be getting in the mood for these huge matches. Croatia taking on Spain. That one in Copenhagen, and then that's the early game build up from 1.30 a.m. Eastern and then from 4.30 a.m. Eastern, France v. Switzerland. Once again, as I bring in Claude's, hello to you, Claude's. We can't miss a minute. We can't afford to. No, we can't. So many great games on in action again tonight and we see that tournament tree starting to fill out. We'll get to that later on in the episode. Guys, as always, we're on Optus Sport, also on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter, so get your comments in. I'm having a read of them and get involved in our poll as we get back to the football tonight, Mel, which we should do <laughs> probably more often. And the question is, we're looking at the best midfield duos of the modern Euro era. We're talking Pogba and Kante, who are in action later mm. tonight. We're talking Rakitic and Modric. And we're talking Xavi and Iniesta, who was the best midfield duo. Yeah, I think you've got an other as well for the people that will be aggressively against the only option, those three options. Yes, yeah, there is an other option apparently as well for all those <laughs> other fans. But I was talking those three teams because they're all in action Yeah, tonight. no, exactly right. And yeah, you can jump on Twitter. I think I voted. I can't even remember what I voted for. It's all it's a bit of a blur. Yes, no, let's be real. Yeah, well, actually, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. But uh, yes, let's talk about what happened last night mm. because we were talking yesterday about the lack of major upsets. And I think we may have seen our first one with the Dutch bowing out. Yeah, you jinxed it, Mel. It was a great yeah, call. Sorry. Mel said yesterday on the show, we haven't seen a major upset yet. And then Czech Republic stunned the Dutch with a 2-0 win. Didn't see that one coming, but there were a few major moments in that game which, which changed everything. Yeah, well, exactly. Thank you for leading me in so well. What a team. Yes, there was a red card incident. How often do you see afterwards the player in question that was sent off? This is Delit, who is completely distraught and taking full responsibility. In fairness, probably did change the momentum, but he's put his hand up straight away and said it's all his fault, which, you know, it's not all his fault, but, uh, yeah, really sad state of affairs really it's that's the risky play when you're playing center back it's, it's such a crucial position you saw that photo you wouldn't be mistaken in thinking that was a try from the origin last night <laughs> I, I saw that one and thought yeah definitely a red card has to go var agreed and, and that changed the game the check ran with it after that so yeah indeed and then in the other match you would often say portugal bowing out is an upset however it's up against the world number one in belgium um so portugal obviously the defending champions they are on their way out so much focus, which is no big shock at all, on Cristiano Ronaldo. Who else? Who was, you know, right in the thick of everything. And uh, yeah, he wasn't too happy. No, he wasn't too happy about it. And he was, he was quoted after the game speaking to Thibaut Courtois. He said, culo, eh? He didn't just say lucky. He said the word culo, which means backside, right? In, mm. in Spanish, Italian, whatever you're going at. And it, it, it's not really a nice way of saying that you were lucky. So it was, it was a little bit petty from him. The ball didn't want to get in today. No, it was wasn't cool at all. It's not what you say at full time. The it's, ball didn't want to, well. No, no, it's not really what you say. But, I mean, he was, you could tell he was quite frustrated. There were other images that emerged of him, you know, not happy after the game, tossing his captain's armband mm. around. It is potentially his last Euro. Yeah, that's fight. right. We know what we know what a fierce competitor he is. Yeah, throwing the armband, the captain's armband, on the ground. Always puts himself in the thick of everything, be it, you know, taking a penalty, take the free kicks, and you don't go up against Ronaldo, do you? And I, I believe we've got word from Coca-Cola, who I think have insisted on the last word. Should we have a look? Oh, press conference. <laughs> if this is not the ultimate revenge, I don't know what is. Yeah, look, Ronaldo. See you later. Ronaldo out. They're calling him Ronaldo out now. <laughs> Coca-Cola still in. So great job from the Optus editing team, I, as always. I heard Coke Naldo. I did some more cheese. Roberto Mancini. I'm always the one that has to say these things. And there goes my street cred once again for another night. On that note, someone who probably has a fair bit more credibility than me, it's fair to say. It's time for Euro to the max. Let's go to Max Rushton somewhere in London, I believe, maybe chilling out. I don't know, I've, hopefully you've seen the footage, genius footage of um, Ronaldo and Coca-Cola mm. finally, well, Ronaldo getting his comeuppance finally. I, I suspect the, you know, the TV awards for seven second segments about sentient bottles of Coca-Cola are coming Optus's way. And I, for one, am <laughs> fully in support of that. Welcome. Uh, both of you and Australians, of course, to the cafe that we go to when the weather is terrible in London. Philippe Auclair, French football expert, is with me. I'm mainly thinking about whether England play 3 4 3, 3 5 2, or 4 3 3, but there are games before <laughs> the England game, and I should remember that. Uh, you have, Philippe, well, you have 
knowledge of the French team already? Well, I, I think judging by the uh, last training session, uh, Didier Deschamps is going to go for something a little bit unusual, to say the least, because he's had now managed 116 games uh, for France, winning 66% of them. Uh, so that's the stats done with. Okay, done. <laughs> <laughs> and only on few occasions has he played with three at the back. Right. And it seems that's going to be the case against the Swiss. Why is he going to do that? Well, very good question. Uh, perhaps the injury to Luca Digne. Uh, so Luca Hernandez will come as a wing back. Perhaps as an effort to mirror uh, what the Swiss uh, are, are doing on the, on the field. Perhaps as well uh, the need to involve more uh, Antoine Griezmann. And he's tried before, I mean, in 2019, 2020, against Albania, against Sweden, against Croatia. And France won three times with that kind of formation, with Griezmann playing as a kind of number 10. So I guess the idea is that you'll have Mbappé and Benzema out front, Griezmann, then a back three with Langley coming in between Kimpembe and Varane, two wing backs, Pogba and, and Kante in, in midfield. I mean, it doesn't sound too good, to be honest. No. Too bad, sorry. It doesn't sound too bad. I mean, it's only Switzerland, though. I mean, you must feel... Uh. Do you look at yesterday and the Czechs beating the Netherlands and mm. think, actually, you know, you shouldn't be complacent in these sort of tournaments? But it's the Swiss aren't all that. Aren't no, they aren't all that, but you're always... I mean, if France is a little bit overcautious, you think, well, there's always a possibility of Shakiri doing what he did in the previous game, a rocket from 25 yards, he can do that. In the past, though, Switzerland have been quite a good opponent for us. I mean, we met them, I think, four times, drew twice, nil-nil in games which didn't really matter, and beat them, and uh, beat them, you remember, I mean, 2004 and in the 2014 World Cup, uh, when, strangely enough, I think Benzema and Giroud were playing the same team that day, incredibly. But we won't see that tonight. So I, I think there's confidence, which is quite normal given the standard of the opponent. But on the other hand, I don't know. I mean, so many strange things have happened during this Euro that uh, I wouldn't put it past the Swiss to uh, give us a bit of a game. Everybody is obsessed here with just French people arguing with each other, <laughs> just to play to stereotype. You know, these stories about Benzema yes, and Giroud sport. and Mbappe and Giroud. Yeah. Is that all being overblown? It is overblown. I mean, uh, there, there, there were some rumbles uh, in, in the French camp due to the inclusion of Karim Benzema. The relationship between Benzema and Giroud is perhaps not as harmonious as you wish it could be between two teammates. But on the other hand, the atmosphere in the camp has been excellent so far. So I think, yes, it's massively o overstated. Uh, up until, of course, a final whistle uh, this evening when we know what the result is going to be. And if it doesn't go well, yes, I think a few things <laughs> are going to um, uh, pop out of the of the French camp, but otherwise no, it's 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 a good mood, it's a harmonious mood. And if I'm allowed to mm -hmm. uh, look ahead to tomorrow, very briefly, you may. As a Frenchman, England v Germany, what do you think will happen? I have absolutely not the slightest idea. Perfect, that's what you're here for. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll be at Wembley tomorrow, and I will be just very stressed about the whole affair. <laughs> Don't start now, Max. Don't don't trouble yourself too early on. Now, just before we let you go, I've we started love already. <laughs> yeah, I, start, know, I, I started it. two weeks ago. when you were born. Come on, <laughs> goes with the territory. But we also we yeah, love listening yeah. to you, Max. But we love listening to Philippe. Can you please ask him just to say anything in our direction? In his yeah. beautiful voice, high Australia. Uh, love I love off to sport or uh, the warm. Okay, just yeah, anything? that's just fine. Okay. Philly, what they want, just because they prefer your voice to mine, <laughs> is just a, a message <laughs> to Australians. You can you can include any of your family and friends who are over there, just straight down the barrel. Like it's the, it, the freedom is yours, Philly. Well, the freedom is mine. So if the freedom is mine, all I wish is that uh, the day is soon going to come when I can finally meet the Australians and the family. I've got some family back in New South Wales. Uh, I was hoping to see them not that long ago. Unfortunately, for reasons you all know, I wasn't able to. Now, I hope it's going to be before the 2022 World Cup. Perfect. And, and Australia will welcome Philippe with open arms and hello to my father-in-law Colin, uh, my sister-in-law Ali and uh, my niece Sunday and Xavier. I mean, I can carry on if you want or you can perhaps get on with the show. It's totally up to you. You can do this no, for hours. I did give you, I gave you the floor and you both certainly delivered. Thank you very much, both of you. Good luck to you and yours and Max. You can be nervous again tomorrow. Cheers. Just relax for now. Thank you. <laughs> Just love it. Oui, oui. That was we, fantastic. Yeah, beautiful. He's, 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 yeah. We, we have to have a look at the um, the knockout tree and see what it all means because we are at the halfway point and we know, obviously, two teams into the quarterfinals. Yeah, this is what it's all about now. We have two of the quarterfinals confirmed. Italy against Belgium won a game. That is in Czech Republic against Denmark. 
Not many people would have predicted that one, but now they've got a pretty good route to the semi-final. Tonight we find out who's going through to fill up those other positions. Belgium, Italy, obviously a, a heavyweight battle. Belgium, I think, are the most travelled team so far in terms of kilometres and with some injury concerns as well. So everyone will be keeping a, a keen eye on that. That's right. They have travelled a lot, but they are world number one. They're full of superstars. I, I don't know if that's an excuse at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair. OK, so we've been talking and looking ahead to Croatia, mm -hmm. taking on Spain. Mm -hmm. With um, Perisic out, we know plenty of the focus, as it always is anyway, is on Luka Modric, who scored a stunner against Scotland. Yeah. Is he warming up for another one? Look at this. It doesn't. It's not a fluke, and he shows it again. He's outside of the right foot. Exact same goal he scored pretty much against Scotland. He shows that he can do it time and time again, and I wouldn't be surprised to see him in that position tonight trying that again. I find it deeply offensive how easy he makes that look, <laughs> can I just say. Love it. Outside <laughs> of the right peg. Not easy for any footballers out there, but he makes no, it look so easy. He certainly does. That's why he's one of the best in the world. Let's speak more on Croatia and Spain. And we're going to go to Melbourne. We always say we love going to Melbourne. Uh, we normally, we chat with Dave Davidovic. He stepped aside because we're going to speak to Do John Dilalitsa. John, welcome to you. We want to speak to you for many different reasons. It's great to have you on the show. First things first, we get to talk as a fan. You get to talk as a fan. Croatia so far, how have you found their form at kind of easing into this tournament? Yeah, it's typically stop-start for the Croatians, I think, as a group of fans following the Croats, we tend to ride the roller coaster a bit with them. We sort of ebb, start with frustration and then exhilaration and then back to frustration. And I think this group phases once again, live that out. You know, the frustration of seeing them play against England um, and then seeing the goal of Modric against the Scots. It's, it's just the typical fare we get from the Croatians every, every two years in the major tournament. So it's always a great ride to go on. Yeah, John, and we saw that footage of Luka Modric. Just he repeated that at training. What a player he is. Now, without Ivan Perisic, though, how much of a loss is that to the Croatians? He was the match winner last time they played Spain at a major tournament. Yeah, I'd go far to say Croatia's absolutely got no chance whatsoever without Perisic, to be entirely <laughs> honest. But I say that with some jest, but he's such an incredible player. He, he's got that physicality, yet he's got the ability to play in tight spaces and the energy that you associate with the more fleet of foot little football up. He's such a powerful athlete that, you know, to pitch him against the Jordi Alba, for example, uh, on the, that Croatian left wing or, uh, or, or against the Aspilicueta, you'd really see him, um, you know, ragdoll some of those smallish fullbacks. So huge loss for Croatia and, you know, the fact he scored, I think, two goals so far this tournament and carrying on from the 2018 World Cup, winning the title with Inter, you know, the size of that loss um, is massive for the Croats. So whether they can come, whether they can compensate for that, that'll determine how they go uh, tomorrow morning. Well, John, one thing the players certainly will enjoy, and they've spoken a bit about this in the last day or so, is uh, having so many Croatian fans, which they haven't really been able to enjoy so far. And I think tickets, uh, allocated tickets, went with, within say three or four hours, all gone, and it's certainly going to make a difference, surely. Yeah, it's one of the great experiences following the Croatian national team. I was lucky enough to go to Portugal in 2004 to follow the team. And they, they played France, they played England um, in the group phases. And the actual repartee between the supporters was as good as I've ever experienced in my life. So no doubt tonight's match uh, will be you know, no different. The Croatian fans are superb. They wear the water polo, you must, you know, headgear and, and all the rest <laughs> of it. So they're a special, special group. And, you know, with the Spanish fans hopefully making a lot of noise tonight, it'll be awesome. And John, you mentioned the Croatian fans, so many of them here in Australia and such a passionate bunch. I wanted to ask you about, there's a poster that we have here on set. It's lived throughout the whole season and that's a poster for Football Belongs, a concept which you help bring to life. And it's been so well received here among the Optus team and all our viewers. And I just wanted to ask you about that, how proud you are of this brilliant series and what response you've had to it. Yeah, it's been pretty overwhelming at times. I think David, your great colleague at Optus and his partner in crime, Ben Coonan, deserve a lot of credit for their energy in bringing that to life. You know, Rich Bayless has shown great faith in all of us to allow us to tell those stories. Um, for us, it's part of our DNA. That's, they're the sort of discussions that we'd have over a coffee or over a beer and talk about this intersection between what football means to us, what it should mean to the nation, how we can hopefully embed it more deeply in what it means to be Australian. So Optus giving us that platform has been uh, something I'm really grateful for. Um, you know, a lot of us put so much time and effort into the game away from the cameras. So it's nice to be able to tell those stories and bring that stuff into what is effectively now a, a mainstream platform. It's something we've been denied in the past. So all credit to Rich and his team for giving us the oxygen, the platform and the courage to tell some of these really special stories. 
Yeah, and John, you've been so heavily involved in football in general in this country and, and the A-League all along the way in, I guess, different forms. Um, PFA for many years as well as, uh, well, now your most recent role, Melbourne Victory Football Director, which I believe you're starting this week. Correct me if I'm wrong. How... Where do you think the game's at in, in that regard? Because it's come such a long way. And, of course, um, man, 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 I was going to say Manchester City, Melbourne City won the grand final yesterday. Yeah, I mean, I think it's certainly been a roller coaster ride in recent years. Uh, hopefully there's been some recalibration of the game's financial modelling. And I'm really optimistic about where the game's heading. You know, I'll, I'll step back into the game after some time away because I really believe in where the league's heading. I believe in the project that... Melbourne Victory is now embarking on after what's been a difficult couple of years. You know, they're showing huge um, ambition in going out and, and seeking possibly the best coach uh, in the league in Tony Popovich. So, you know, at a club land, we're seeing that ambition at, at club level, but equally we're seeing, you know, the Australian professional leagues really now getting invested in, you know, the next five years of the game through a great broadcast deal, hopefully some other great commercial news on the horizon beyond that. And, you know, a lot of us put our lives in the game. Uh, we invest our livelihoods in the sport when you know we could be doing other things, but we genuinely believe in where the game's heading. And you know, I'm really confident and optimistic about the next you know 12 months, two years, five years, ten years. You know, it, it, it's the game needs to get to where we all want it to be. And what about recruitment in your role? Um, you looking at the Euros for recruitment at all for victory? Yeah, I had some people ask me um, whether there's a third Hazard brother, so we're searching the. Um, Searching for him at the moment. The first two are taken, but hopefully there's a third one out there that we can <laughs> unlock. Um, but Victory <laughs> have got a good tradition as well of finding some really high-level players from major tournaments. I think Ola Toivon and Jorned after the yep. World Cup a few years ago. Honda may have done the same thing. So, you know, it's a really good opportunity to, to not necessarily just look at names either, but some players who might be playing in some, you know, quote-unquote secondary leagues who want to be a star. And... The A-League does give players platforms to become stars of our competition. You know, whether it's a Carlos Hernandez or a Bruno Fornaroli, the sort of players who weren't huge names when they came to the country, but can use the A-League as a place to really emerge as a talisman within their team. So we're not just looking for those big names. We're also looking for players that we think can move the dial week in, week out and excite the fans. Yeah, we need to get back to that, Claude. Yeah, that's right, John. Exciting times for our local football and for you. Congratulations on the role. I'm sure you'll smash it as always. And one thing we love to do on the show, thanks to our sponsors, Tab, we ask our guests for a big call. And this is a call that might be a little bit left field, particularly about the games coming up tonight. John, I'm going to throw to you for this one. Well, um, I'm predicting a late false positive and Perisic being allowed to play. <laughs> and as a consequence <laughs> of that, the Croats are going to win 3-0. So a 3 year win to Croatia on the back of a Perisic revival. Brett Sutanic has apparently <laughs> cleared him to play, so we're looking forward to it. <laughs> I like it. Thanks very much, John. It's been great to get your thoughts. And as Claude said, good luck in the role. Um, don't mind that one. Yeah, look, that's probably the most left field we've had so far. Yep. It's got a bit of off field, a bit of on field, but why great. not? Great. Okay, is that time? It's time. Where's Ollie? Well, it was a massive day of action yesterday and fingers crossed today will be no different, but it's a big day for me because of course my team, and when I say my team, I mean since Scotland has left the tournament, my new team, Croatia. It's time for them to play. I'm absolutely psyched for this one. So to get into the spirit and the mood, I'm going to go to a cafe, sit outside, very European style of course, have a cold meat sandwich and a coffee, which I googled, is apparently a pretty traditional Croatian breakfast. And then of course later on today, I will track my fans down, my people, and we are gonna watch what is hopefully gonna be a big win for the red and white. What's happening guys? I see all your predictions coming through on the social feeds. Lin Ming Soon says Switzerland are going to beat the French 2-1. Milly thinks that the French will beat them quite comfortably. Simon agrees with an easy job for France tonight, but Milly says you never know. Football is a sport where anything can happen. It truly is. Guys, you just saw Oli, but Oli just yesterday caught up with Marcus Schwarzer. Scotland are out, so he needed a new team to follow and he went shirt shopping. Surprise! It's actually me. Sorry to disappoint you. 
Did you get excited? Not at all, mate. Not I knew all. it was you. Right, whatever. Anyway, we're down here in Shoreditch, my part of the world where the cool people live. Managed to get you out here. Um, but I'm miserable because I don't need this shirt anymore. The Scots are out. So today, you're going to get me a new team, all right? Yeah, let's try it. Because you know what? I've got obviously the best shirt that's in this place. I, even before we go in there, I know this is the best shirt. Let's try a few on, see what team I can choose. Yeah, I'll find you a better one. Done. All right, so we're in the current Euro section having a look at the clubs uh, still in the competition. Now, what I want you to do, Mark, pull a few favourites out. Give me a bit of a storyline behind it, why I should appreciate the shirt and maybe why I could pick that team. Well, first and foremost, I think one that's very, very iconic with Australian fans, especially the Croatian community, has to be the Croatian jersey. Look at that one. Oh, my word. 1998. Now, that is not only one of the great Croatian shirts, but that's one of the great shirts. That is pretty amazing. Tell you what, there's a couple of French ones here that are absolute Ooh, legendary. Beautiful. Benzema. Benzema. Yeah. That is amazing. I love that one. But I'm telling you now, nothing surpasses this one. This is the greatest one of all time. Why? The design, everything yeah. about it, that is the best shirt ever. Well, there's a few over here that I don't, I've got my eye on. This one, of course, this Swedish shirt. That is nice. Now, that is like Larson all yeah. over. Yeah, is, you like that? Yeah, you, yeah, can, you can, look like a heavy collar man. Yeah, exactly. Hey, by the way, also, not that I'm going to pick them, but what is it with Wales copying Australia with their they away They do shirts? like it a bit, don't they? Like, that's, come like, on. that's the second time now we've seen it. We're in England. So we shirts. They've what? had some rascals as well, by the way. Is that a good thing? I think so, yeah. A rascal. I mean, this is a 1990 92 shirt. Yeah. World Cup 92. Umbro 92. again. The Umbro for me, a bit like the retro Adidas symbol, yep. very nice. 1996. No. What a rascal that is. That was Gareth Southgate. Sorry, Gareth, missed the penalty. <laughs> Don't bring that one up. <laughs> yes, I have found the best bucket hat of all time. Anyway, the great unveiling, Oli Gill, who have you decided? Zdravo. So predictable. I am Croatia. It just feels right, doesn't it? Nico Cranchar <gasps> let himself severely go. That is the ultimate compliment. Good luck, Mark. Is it? <laughs> for me, it is. Welcome back to the warm-up. Now, Claude, we've talked a fair bit about Croatia, Spain. Mm. Now we need to focus on the small task at hand, Switzerland taking on France. Of course, you showcase jerseys most nights and uh, you're going for the underdog, the huge underdog. How big an upset would it be if Switzerland beat France? It'd be massive. And the, the last two times they met at major tournaments, they drew 0-0. So the Swiss do know how to hold them out. Mm. And if you look at their tournaments so far, France won their first game and then they've had two draws. Switzerland have done the opposite and they've won their most recent group match. So I don't know. I don't think it's as straightforward as it seems. You've been death riding France, be honest. Yeah. I'm, I'm, you made the call early on. <laughs> I think so. I said I said the French weren't going to be great this tournament and I've copped so much hate for that online. So I hope that the Swiss can prove me right. Tonight. You could turn out to be the wisest man. We are yet to see. Well, let's go. Adriano Del Monte has been a very busy man out and about traveling all through the tournament so far. Let's say hello to him now, Adriano. Great to be with you as always, guys. Today from my sixth city here at Euro 2020, here in the wonderful Bucharest, ahead of a very intriguing fixture tonight, France and Switzerland. I can tell you the match tonight, my ninth of the tournament, it kicks off at 10 p.m. local time. So a late night in the store, no doubt about that, especially if it goes to extra time or penalties could be there until all hours of the morning. But certainly looking forward to this one, of course. France, the overwhelming favorites coming into the tournament. Their group stage form, well, not the best. Obviously two draws in their final two fixtures against Hungary and Portugal, both of those fixtures in Budapest. Full crowds there for Switzerland. I got a close look at them as well in Group A against Italy, where they were not impressive whatsoever, despite their very strong form coming into the tournament. But two solid outings against Wales and a big win against Turkey on the final day. Very important, bringing some nice form in. Now, Didier Deschamps did speak about his team's form in the lead up. He highlighted a couple of key players, particularly Paul Pogba who was very, very strong in that final match against Portugal. But he did say the heat did impact his players. Now, I can tell you here in Bucharest, it is quite warm. We aren't expecting boiling conditions as we saw in Budapest for the match. But I think he feels his players will be a little fresher coming in to this one. Conversely, for Petkovic in Switzerland, well, he certainly knows his team have a very tall order here tonight. 
against such opponents uh, as France is if you all give a hundred percent and they give a hundred percent this won't be enough so we have to go beyond our limits and give a hundred percent hundred and twenty percent and uh, hoping that France won't show their hundred percent so it certainly will be a tough task for the Swiss who, well, they come in with nothing to lose. A fourth consecutive international tournament, knockout stage appearance. They have never beaten France in a competitive fixture. France, well, with it, all to lose, all the pressure on them. Of course, the winner of this match take on the winner of Croatia and Spain in the quarterfinals. I'll join Optusport later on this evening from the stadium here in Bucharest ahead of France up against Switzerland. Thank you, sir. As mentioned, very busy man. Look forward to chatting with him a little bit later. Now, some news coming out uh, ahead of Max touch on this. England, Germany, a monster one to look forward to tomorrow, shall we say. Um, the two players, the Chelsea duo that were in isolation, Ben Chilwell and Mason Mount, they are out of isolation, but training alongside, but on the other field to England. Yeah. And Gareth Southgate, the manager, is a, I guess he's pondering, maybe a little bit nervous about whether to use them, particularly Mason Mount. Um, and he said, because they've been in isolation, how that might affect them. Yeah, definitely might. I'm not too sure how to take I'd, I'd be very surprised if they start in that game tomorrow night, but hopefully on the bench. Mason Mount has been one of the best players in English jersey this tournament. He's been in brilliant form, and I think that he'll be happy to have him back, if not for tomorrow night, hopefully for the rounds after that. If they yeah, get there. Well, it's a tough task. It is. It's a very big task, but, you know, as we know, it's a tough task for everyone. Yeah. Is there going to be an upset tonight? I guess we're going to find out. Just to remind you, the match is coming up. If for some reason you missed it, we weren't clear enough. Croatia taking on Spain is our early game and it is early. 1.30 a.m. Eastern is the build-up. You don't want to miss a minute. You get all the team news, the all-important team news, and that will flow on into France v Switzerland, either through a you know post-match pre-game or maybe extra time, maybe penalties. Mm. Who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, anything could happen here. We saw that this morning with the Czechs against the Dutch. No one would have predicted that, so don't sleep on this fixture. No, no time. We've, we've ordered no sleep through the entire tournament. Why would today be any different? And of course, if you miss a minute, you've caught have the Euro Brecky wrap with Jules and Schwartzy. Jules, what can we look forward to this time? Yeah, thanks, Mel. Karen Carney and Guy Scamendietta will be joining me to dissect the day's play. Johnny Aloisi will pinpoint just where and how the matches were won. And Rich Bayliss pulls out some more magical moments from the past. We'll have all the news going on into the final games of the last 16. And another celebrity will stop by to give us their tips. See you a little bit later. Excellent. Thank you, Jules. We look forward to it all. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. More football. Good luck to you. And your... Yeah, sounds, sounds <laughs> great, doesn't it? Enjoy your football. We'll see you tomorrow.